Hi, and thanks for joining us. My name is Maddie Kyle, and I am a Content Launch Manager at Oculus. For my role, I review thousands of VR applications to make sure they meet the Oculus Store guidelines. I also assist developers with game design and publishing best practices so that they can be successful as they create VR applications. In this video, we will demonstrate the importance of considering many different participant types in order to create accessible, immersive experiences. We'll do this by introducing learners to scenarios in which accessible design broadens who can participate in applications, as well as some best practices to avoid creating jarring or dissonant experiences during gameplay. Developing for virtual reality adds challenges that a designer won't always encounter when developing a conventional 2D or 3D game. Oculus is aware of these challenges and has put together a set of VRCs or virtual reality checks to help designers address these challenges. Those who have developed in VR for Oculus before will probably already be aware of the performance VRCs in place before a game can be published on the Oculus Store. During this video, we will be learning the techniques and practices that can make apps more accessible, inclusive, and empowering for participants. This includes subtitle options, UI and UX design, in-game feedback and direction, customizable controller configurations, distance grabbing, display setting customization, color blindness support, multiple locomotion options, and head tracking alternatives. When you've finished this video, you should be ready to step forward into a world of accessible design and prepare your virtual reality application to pass the Oculus Accessibility VRCs. Accessibility in VR app design can have a major impact on the application. For some participants, it will determine if experiences are positive or negative, memorable or not. Accessibility in game design is something you should consider from the very beginning, no matter what game engine you are developing in. Regardless of the technologies we might use to create new worlds, if we begin with an empathetic approach that considers the perspectives of all potential players, we will create stronger, more meaningful experiences for everyone. Rather than treating inclusion as a feature or an add-on, center your experience design around it from the beginning and on an ongoing basis afterwards. As you imagine mechanics and begin testing to find the fun for neurotypical and able-bodied people, consider in equal measure ways for those with different needs to engage in the experiences you design. For some, Creating a persona can be helpful for maintaining an inclusive approach throughout the design process. A persona is a hypothetical participant in your experience with specific motivations, desires, and traits, typically based on research and interviews with real people. In other words, who are they? How will they experience your app? Why are they playing? Imagine an experience that requires a person using a wheelchair to move around the room while simultaneously using both hands to pick up objects, push buttons, and grab levers. Think of the challenges that this person now faces because the designer didn't consider alternative locomotion methods. To move, this person would need to first set down their controllers, then move into a position, pick the controllers back up, and finally, interact with the world. This kind of scenario could have been easily mitigated by allowing physical movement in the world as well as the ability to use teleportation. This would allow the participant to point the controller where they want to be, warp to that position, and continue enjoying the experience without interruption. Consider a person who is colorblind, who is handed a puzzle where they are tasked with matching specific colored icons with each other. Depending on the type of colorblindness this person might have, the colors could become a frustrating barrier to moving forward in that experience. On the other hand, if these differently colored pieces also had a shape, letter, or pattern that corresponded to them, this person could still interact effectively with the puzzle. A designer may want to build an immersive experience in which enemies surround the participants in all directions. Without accessibility considerations, this could become problematic for people who aren't able to turn their heads due to injuries or paralysis. In this case, if the designer provided participants with ways to turn the character's head using thumbsticks or a quick pivot button that would allow them to rapidly spin 90 or 180 degrees, they would facilitate an uninterrupted experience for players with limited mobility. When these types of accessibility considerations are incorporated into early design phases, 
Creators will not only produce the most inclusive experiences possible, they will also save time and resources in not having to go back into their projects later to modify or add these features. There's a wide spectrum of visual impairments that participants of your application might experience on a daily basis. It's important to implement options into your application that allow these people to experience your application properly. One of the most common issues players face is colorblindness. Our eyes see using a combination of cones and rods. Cones contain color pigments that help our eyes detect light frequencies as they are reflected off of objects with varying colors. If any of those pigments are missing, then our eyes won't be able to detect those colors as easily, or at all. The most common form of colorblindness is red-green, which entails trouble differentiating or detecting green and red. We can already imagine how this might lead to a frustrating experience for people with red-green colorblindness in a world where red means stop and green means go. But red-green is not the only type of colorblindness. There's also blue-yellow colorblindness and complete colorblindness. When building experiences, there's no one right way to address all forms of colorblindness. But the following examples help show how to think about addressing it within the specific application you are creating. In the case of puzzles that we mentioned earlier, you might offer color schemes that have been tested to work with different forms of colorblindness. Remember that the lack of color pigment in the cones means that the color cannot be detected, and this will also impact blended colors like purple, which is a mixture of blue and red. So side by side, blue and purple might look identical to someone who cannot differentiate between red and green. Choosing a schema with one very dark color and one very light color might be another way to provide an intuitive experience for participants with color blindness. Another way you could remove this barrier for your players is to integrate patterns or shapes that provide an additional reference point beyond color. For example, if you absolutely need red for stop and green for go, you might consider putting a stop sign in place with the word stop and use a circle or arrow shape for go. You know, it looks like we're gonna be in hyperspace for a while here, so feel free to go back and check our loot, you name it. Sky's the limit. This is also something we should remember when offering cues in text. You may want to highlight a specific word as a hint towards solving a puzzle. If the color of the word is how this will be distinguished, it's recommended to put it in a color that is not impacted by color blindness, as well as using a shader, font, style, or texture that serves as an additional indicator. You might choose to make it red and bold, or red and all caps or red and glowing. Whatever your decision, it's important to always test on a diverse user group to make sure it is achieving the desired results without unintended friction for any users. Let's take a moment to reinforce the importance of making sure that our applications can clear the Oculus Accessibility VRCs. We've all had experiences where we've had to strain our eyes to see something, maybe because something is small and blurry or really far away. When we have to strain like this, we feel frustration because we feel like we can almost see it, but can't quite see it in full clarity. When we as designers don't take accessibility considerations into account, that's one of the feelings we risk causing our participants. They might be able to barely make out what's going on with the red line you've asked them to follow, for example, but not have enough ease with it that they can use it intuitively and without distraction. They might infer that there is a different shade on the walls, and know it must mean something, but may have confusion around why because they lack the full context. That level of frustration can definitely impact an experience, and is something we should continue to think about while designing interactive experiences. Our applications should incorporate the ability to customize all of the varying color and brightness settings to allow people to adjust to their preferences. If possible, it's also advisable to incorporate some pre-built settings to help those of varying color capability. Providing presets for protoanopia, deuteranopia, and tridanopia tied to different shader sets can give your artists better control over how things will look to those players, whereas only having customization would put the responsibility entirely on the player. Settings that your user should be able to customize are contrast, brightness, and saturation. Another helpful test that designers can and should take advantage of is setting their experience to grayscale mode 
to see if the experience is still accurate and easy to navigate without color. This will allow them and other testers to approximate the experience of playing the game as someone with complete colorblindness. Note that there are quite a few considerations to make when shifting your game to a grayscale. It is likely that your lighting implementation will change, as well as some of the color shifts that were implemented to declare mood. It's then your job as a designer to develop new translations of these implementations within the grayscale environment. It's important to remember that colorblindness impacts all visual aspects of your application, not just the environment. When building out subtitling or menus, for example, you may want to use specific colors to highlight important keyed items or subtext. Aside from changing their color, it might be helpful to make their font larger than the standard text size, or perhaps in bold, or all caps. That way, if a given participant cannot see the color change, they can still intuitively pick up on the context cues you as a designer are trying to offer. The final point to remember when designing for people with limited or no vision is to make sure your sound design accurately reflects the positioning of objects in the virtual space. In fact, this is actually a best practice for all experiences, making them richer and more immersive for everyone. Spatial audio and VR more closely mirrors how sound operates in the real world. By spatializing your sound, you can help everyone accurately discern the distance and placement of items based on the sound source generated in space, and the varying points of audio that are occluded or reflected as they move through the environment you've created. Oculus provides its Spatializer plugin to make this easy for developers, but any tool that effectively spatializes audio in an immersive experience will go a long way towards improving the overall quality of your experience. Although this is not a VRC, while talking to gamers with varying levels of visual acuity, the ability to customize the audio in the game was key for them to enjoy the title. The auditory experience is understandably of the utmost importance for these participants. If, for example, the background music covers up important collisions or other environment interaction effects, they may have trouble navigating the world. By giving participants the ability to customize their audio experience, Designers allow them to adjust their experience for real-world factors such as headphone quality or hearing ability. Subtitles are not new to media experiences and are now commonplace across film, TV, and games. They are also extremely important for people who are deaf or have hearing loss. Designing your app without subtitles will immediately alienate a portion of your audience. And it's not just important that designers include subtitles, but that they are implemented in ways that are not hard to read or poorly paced. No, no. This place will be swarming with troopers in seconds. This is Admiral Karras. All personnel alert. Prisoners have escaped. Lock down the hangar and secure all exits. Ah, oh, we'll never get to our ship now. Each app will bring with it its own unique considerations around facilitating positive experiences across varying hearing capabilities. But we will focus here on what the Oculus VRCs have documented to be the most critical. The benchmark indicator of strong subtitling is if testers have the ability to play through an entire experience without audio. If your subtitles accurately and effectively replace the sound design, you have created accessible subtitles. The first thing for designers to consider when implementing subtitles is the degree of customization allowed. Participants should have the ability to update the font size of the subtitles. Enabling this customization will empower participants to choose how they want to encounter written information within a given experience. Some people might prefer to play without subtitles at any point, so it's the designer's job to give them the ability to simply disable them easily. Participants should also be able to choose how large subtitles are, allowing those with low vision to simply enlarge and brighten the subtitles until they are easy to read. When designing inclusive subtitles, it is considered best practice to have two to three presets the player can select from. With those three, you can design a preset that matches your game's aesthetic, a sans serif font for readability, and a dyslexia-friendly font as your third. When considering dyslexia-friendly fonts, there are a few things to keep in mind. You want a sans serif font. The space between your letters known as tracking should be at around 35% of your character width. 
Spacing between words should be 3.5 times that of your character width. Finally, avoid underlining or italics. Comic Sans is an example of a dyslexia-friendly font due to its lack of serifs, tracking, and word-to-word -word spacing. It is also generally recommended that you put a background behind your subtitle segment that is the contrasting color of the subtitle itself. There are several recommended guidelines for this type of implementation. Fonts should be sans serif and set to solid white. A black background behind the text with opacity at the participant's discretion will also increase readability of the text. Visual cues inside of the subtitles, delineating who is speaking or the general sound source to help move the user visually through the environment. Taking a look at Subtitles in Vacation Simulator, this video shows some great subtitle implementation. Notice the text above the object instructing the player and how the arrow from the box is pointing towards the photo window. You know exactly where the information is coming from and the text is easy to read. It's also worth pointing out that the default text size is in a median range. It isn't incredibly large or small, but a middle point that most can read. In addition to adding a visual indicator tying the subtitles to the source of the audio, whether that's an explosion or a person talking to you through portions of the narrative, it's also a good idea to leave that indicator on screen if your participant is looking away from the source of the sound. Generally speaking, people who aren't audibly impaired will pick up on the cue that the person is off to the right or the left due to the spatialization of the audio. But without any kind of visual cue tied to your subtitles, people with hearing loss won't know whom or what is driving your narrative or tutorial forward. This could lead to big problems for these participants, possibly causing them to stare in the wrong direction without realizing there are objects or non-player characters to interact with. Just as games have implemented options to help their players navigate to objectives or waypoints, immersive designers should make sure their subtitles help players navigate to sources of the text or sound. This would also be extremely helpful, for example, if your experience asks participants to turn off a radio, answer a door, or any other situation where an audible cue is intended to trigger interaction. Perhaps a musical note pops up on screen and has an arrow pointing towards the radio, or the door pops up a dialog box with readable text to draw the participant's attention. If they're looking away from the door, an arrow pointing in the direction of the door could pulse while pointing towards their objective. Meanwhile, the dialog box might vibrate with the words knock knock displayed inside. The final primary consideration to make regarding subtitles is localization. Subtitles are also important for speakers of different languages than the ones native to the app's designers. From a business perspective, it is highly effective to translate text into multiple languages so that players who do not speak the language that the application was designed in can engage with it. It's much more expensive and time-consuming to re-record and implement all of your audio in multiple languages, though in some cases, this will be the desired route. Making sure you have as many languages as possible available for your subtitles not only provides rich experiences for people with varying hearing ability, but opens the application up to many other possible participants who speak and understand different languages. Head tracking in VR is something that can easily be taken for granted. Since applications will often have the game camera follow the player's head position by default, it's important to remember that for some, this isn't possible. For people with limited or no head mobility, it is advisable that designers should implement other ways for participants to control the camera. When considering this option, it's important to offer directional inputs as well as single button presses. By approaching these implementations from a position of empathy, designers invite users of all ability levels to take part. If your app, for example, is a fast-paced shooter with enemies coming at participants from all angles and it relies solely on head tracking, the game becomes unplayable for a large group of potential players. Implementing instead the ability to rotate the camera view at rapidly snapping intervals such as 90 or 180 degrees by clicking in the left or right thumbsticks would be one great way to allow participants to move around environments rapidly and still experience the unique properties of the 360 degree immersion. When implementing snap turning, there are two methods that are most commonly used. First is quick turns. Tapping on the thumbstick left or right rotates you quickly between 30 and 45 degrees. The second is snap turns. Tapping on the thumbstick left or right immediately rotates you with no transition time between 30 and 45 degrees. On the other hand, 
Perhaps your app is something with a slower pace or has slower pace sections that allow participants to move the camera as they aim with the thumbsticks. Once their aim goes beyond a defined threshold, designers could institute a feature that lets them now begin rotating the camera to allow them to see more of the world. In this case, it also might make sense to build in thumbstick sensitivity customization. Audio commands might become a solution here too, which would also bear in mind people unable to use their thumbs or other fingers. The point is that there's no one right answer, but there are lots of possibilities that designers can consider on the way to finding the right solution for their unique application. When implementing various forms of locomotion, designers can also consider controlling camera framing and position to focus on important scenes or moments in the experience. Perhaps implementing a Rails mode for your game would be a better option to allow those with limited head mobility to enjoy the experience. When putting a game on Rails, you effectively remove forward and backwards locomotion from the player. The app then performs as if the player is riding on a carnival car on Rails. With this being added, the player could then be allowed to look around the scene with a thumbstick control or quick snap rotation buttons limiting their need for mobility while experiencing your world. A common pitfall when working with alternatives to head tracking is the temptation to have the game take control of the camera view. Remember that in a VR experience, the camera is the participant's perspective. When that perspective is forcibly taken away from participants, designers greatly increase the risk of causing disorientation and nausea. If you are planning on implementing these types of solutions, they should always be tested thoroughly by a variety of possible participants to ensure that new problems aren't being unintentionally created. Now that we've gone over a variety of accessibility ideas, let's consider how we can make interacting with objects more accessible. Let's turn back to the example of a person with limited mobility. Requiring them to walk through a world to interact with an object can add challenges for them that would detract from their experience. When thinking about how to make our apps inclusive of people with limited mobility, we need to consider more than just the basic locomotion in space. We also need to think about other aspects of mobility. Does the app ask players to bend down and pick up objects or reach up into a shelf? If a participant must stay at a fixed height in the real world, we as designers have to create the framework for them to proceed in our apps comfortably. Taking these considerations into account will also enable designers to make applications that are conducive for use in real-world cramped spaces. When implementing object interaction, the accessibility consideration is providing people the ability to interact with the object from a distance. Allowing people to hover over the object with their controllers and perform the required interaction is an easy way to implement an accessible design for those with varying degrees of mobility. When implementing this feature, it's also important to make sure that the ray cast from the head of the controller is visible for those with different levels of visual acuity. Allowing participants to modify the extent to which these affordances are granted will empower them to customize the experience to fit the varying accommodations they may need or want to complete it. As you consider implementing locomotion options, it is recommended that you, whenever possible, offer varying options of locomotion for your players. One of the options we discussed when we talked about head tracking was snap turning. Other modes to keep in mind are teleportation, free locomotion, or the ability to move freely throughout the world by walking around the play space and potentially putting your experience on rails for those with no mobility. Teleportation allows people to aim their controller to a specific point in the environment and quickly teleport themselves to that location. This form of locomotion limits the amount of movement required of the players. Teleportation can be combined with other forms of head tracking replacements that allow participants to move easily through the virtual environment. These include quick turns, where participants tap left or right on the thumbstick to rotate quickly between 30 and 45 degrees. Snap turns, in which tapping on the thumbstick left or right immediately rotates participants with no transition time between 30 and 45 degrees. By implementing these curb cuts, people with limited mobility would be able to find ways to quickly move through the experience if needed by pointing and clicking to various locations, and still be able to look around, aim, and interact with the environment objects as needed. It's also common practice to allow participants to move through the environment using thumbsticks on the controller. 
Implementing this type of free locomotion allows the player to stay seated or in place and still move through your world. When assessing your app for the types of locomotion you will be implementing, it is important to think of the range and scope of the players you're trying to reach. If your goal is to appeal to as many different participants and demographics as possible, having customizable and inclusive locomotion options will serve this goal tremendously. Remember, including these discussions and considerations as part of your roadmap from the very beginning will make implementation easier than going back later to add in new options. Controller customization is something we take for granted in conventional gaming experiences. But when developing in VR, which takes advantage of full immersion, the stakes are much higher. Not only will enabling controller customization allow players of varying skill levels and ability to tune the experience to their needs, but it can also allow them to find more enjoyment while participating. Remember to think about everything the participants should be able to enable, disable, and customize when they want to modify the control schemas of the experience. Optimal button customization would allow players to adjust aspects such as thumbstick sensitivity, axis response, as well as choosing to invert thumbstick axes, the command implications of the various pushable buttons, the sensitivity of motion-based tracking, including head tracking, hand tracking, and controller position updates, aggressiveness or the degree of movement assigned to snap turning, which hand holds the dominant functions for gameplay features, for example, if your features assume a right-handed player, the ability to switch handedness or vice versa. Of course, this basic list is just a starting point in your thinking. Each experience will bring its own unique set of needs and corresponding considerations. As a developer, one of the most important parts of your job is developing inclusive experiences that break down the barriers and make all participants feel welcome. In-game feedback may be very ingrained in what we do while playing, but imagine trying to interact with an experience without seeing, hearing, or feeling the result. In other words, try playing your app in full grayscale with audio disabled and seated in a fixed chair, respectively. This will help you consider ways that you can provide feedback via multiple avenues to cover a variety of preferences and life experiences. Let's review the opening scene of Vader Immortal. The game opens with you in a spaceship needing to jump to hyperspace. To activate hyperspace, first you have to reach out and flip five toggles. and then grab a large lever and engage hyperspeed. While doing this, there are two notable pieces of feedback. You visually see the toggles move up, and you hear a confirmation tone when they are set in position. As you look to the right, the word grab appears over the switch, and when it is engaged, there is a click sound, and you again have the visual confirmation of seeing the switch seated in the forward position. If you were a person with hearing loss, the only feedback you would have to know that the switch has been engaged is the visual cue of its position. However, when moving switches in virtual reality, it is totally possible to not push the switch all the way forward to the point that it triggers the desired response. Adding a controller vibration to confirm the switch has been put in place will be a great way to bypass any mixed signals or confusion for the player. It's a good practice to walk through the environments and scenarios you're designing, considering a variety of cues. Then, once they're implemented, walk through them with low visibility and then with no sound. Can you navigate the area comfortably? Are you able to find your way? If the answer is yes, you've implemented accessible mechanics. Giving players visual, audio, and haptic feedback cues for affirmation will help guide them through the experience and mitigate confusion or frustration. It's also highly recommended that designers add customization features for participants that enable and disable varying pieces of the feedback. Not everyone is a fan of audio cues, haptic feedback, or other affordances, and some may want to intentionally experience the app at more difficult modes. Providing customization options for participants is a great way to hand them the reins to take part in your experience on their own terms. Another form of in-game feedback that you should consider implementing includes visual icons and cues for when buttons need to be pressed. For example, if you need a player to pull the controller's trigger to open a lantern or press A to pick up an object, 
A visual of the controller popping up on screen with the button that needs to be pressed highlighted is a great way to give people tutorialized context cues. Having the voice of a narrator pop up and say something like, grab the lever or move the box or something along those lines would also mitigate issues for those with low vision. And of course, when considering what colors to use to highlight the options, think about using colors that are still clear to those with colorblindness, as well as bright colors to help shine light in dark environments. Items with high contrast work well in these scenarios. It is also important to consider contextual navigational cues if the participant seems lost or if they are being instructed by an NPC to go somewhere. If the participant needs to head down the path and take a sharp right, visual indicators with arrows showing those directions could indicate that to make it clear for them. If you wanted to help guide them even further, having the arrow grow or pulse more aggressively as the participant gets closer to the objective would let them know they're on the right track. Adding a controller vibration when they reach the destination would add a final cue to confirm for participants that they have correctly achieved the desired goal. In addition to the play component of any immersive experience, the user interface or UI must be designed with accessibility in mind as well. From the heads-up display or HUD, providing crucial information about characters, to taking stock of inventory and objectives, to any other menus participants navigate, UI is a major part of any immersive experience. In previous sections, we've discussed possible options for participants of all accessibility levels. Many of these lessons can apply to our UI as well, ensuring that navigating is easy for participants of all experience levels and backgrounds. Utilizing haptic feedback, high contrast color schemes for text and background for readability, consideration for those with colorblindness, or even modifying to feature colorblind friendly themes at a participant's request are all affordances to consider in building inclusive UI. It's also highly important to know what information your player will need to access at a moment's notice and find ways to surface that for them through the heads-up display. While designing your HUD and other pieces of on-screen UI, make sure that the player has the ability to customize the position and scaling of the various elements. People with limited vision should have the ability to move the UI around the screen to make sure they can see the elements and have access to important information at their specified comfort level. This is also generally just a good practice. Giving people as much customization as possible with menus, options, on-screen display, and more will improve the comfort level and confidence in their experience. It is also important to consider accessibility when drawing your participants' attention to specific UI elements. If you want to snap their attention to the life bar, for example, be sure to use both a visual cue and an auditory cue and possibly a haptic cue for good measure. By implementing an inclusive UI, immersive experience designers will widen their audience while maintaining the maximum comfort and enjoyment for their app. There is no single silver bullet for building an experience that will be intuitive for players of all backgrounds. It is your job as a developer to test, design, and implement as many of these considerations as you deem necessary to make your experience inclusive. This video has given you an overview of the accessibility VRCs that you will need to pass in order to publish your app to the Oculus Store. These VRCs are built with the intent of making the VR landscape accessible to all participants, regardless of their ability or background. Using these to build your projects will help ensure the widest possible audience for your games. But using an empathetic mindset will lead you to solutions that might not arise from just looking at these specific VRCs. Be sure to test your experiences with as many different participants and to have ongoing conversations with them about how to make your experiences as inclusive and accessible as possible. Remember, as VR developers, it's up to us to set and uphold the standards of our applications and thus for the VR content ecosystem. It's our responsibility to explore this new frontier of virtual worlds and make sure we are as inclusive as possible while doing so. We at Oculus are so excited to see all the wonderful and accessible things you will create.